So we talked about the soul, right? We're going to talk about some more external structures for microorganisms. And then we're going to talk about basic um, structures of the eukaryotic cell. And we're going to talk about some uh, fun facts. Okay. So, if you have a bacterial cell, just review. We have a couple more things to talk about. Like glycocalyx. And we're going to briefly describe what it is, and we have uh, external temperatures. So what's glycocalyx? There are two types that we are interested in. It's the capsule and slime. So what are the functions of this um, material structure. For capsule, it's adhesion and protection against phagocytosis. So I'm a functional individual today. Protection against phagocytosis. And for slime layer, it's practically only a So both capsule and slime layer consist mostly of carbohydrates with some elements of proteins, okay? And both of these structures play a role in the biofilm formation. So capsule is, and we'll get to that, capsule is a little bit more dense and rigid. Slime layer is more of a, of a loose structure. Are you with me so far? So, in terms of adhesion, they increase adhesion to the surfaces, therefore enabling microorganisms to form a layer on the surface that is protected against desiccation or predation, and they call this layer a biofilm. So biofilms can form, for instance, on the surfaces of uh, different prosthetic joints. They routinely formed on the surfaces of your teeth, and they are... Um, they, they can form in the respiratory passages of patients with cystic fibrosis or in a catheter. The main problem with biofilms, they are incredibly hard to get rid of due to that, that communal formation of, of, of a protective carbohydrate layer derived from slime layer and caps. Does that make sense? Okay. External appendages. We're going to start like from the simple, so fimbria. Fimbria is an external appendage, hair-like projections made out of proteins that serves mostly, well, almost exclusively for adhesion. Phyllus, that's the singular and Phyla is plural. I'm going to put gene exchange in the first place. It also plays a role in adhesion as well. Okay. And then we have flagellum. Again, flagellum is plural, flagellum is singular. Movement. Now, I, I'm not going to talk about um, too much about like differences between. I'm not going to talk at all about the differences between the positive and the negative. A few things that I want you to appreciate. Flagellum works like a propeller. Okay, does that make sense? So, if 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 this is a flagellum, this will be. Uh, this will be a that's filament. This is the hook. This is the rod. Summary here is the model, and it will work like this. Clear? Like one propeller. A couple of things about the flagellar movement that I want you to to know. One that it has two. 
sort of um, distinct patterns. One pattern is running. That's the movement towards nutrients, for example. Doesn't have to be nutrients only. So this is called positive chemotaxis. It doesn't have to be chemotaxis. It can be magnetotaxis. It can be phototaxis. The point is that running is the movement towards some kind of attractant. Does that make sense? And then there's tumbling. So tumbling is when bacterium is sensing where to run. Are we clear? Does that make sense? So it's like you are um, trying to figure out where you're going in the city. So you think, uh huh, I'm going straight now. You go straight, then you look at the map. Where am I supposed to go next? To go this way, or this way. So this is how bacteria, you know, move. Orientation. Now, last bit about flagellum. is the way they are, how they get an energy. You have to appreciate, you know, when they're moving, they need energy. So on a very basic level, you've got a membrane, okay? And you've got a pump. So this pump is using ATP. It breaks down ATP for energy, and it pumps hydrogen ions across the membrane, okay? And then somewhere, flagellum, somewhere near flagellum, in sort of a flagellar complex, there's a channel. Hydrogen's diffused back. That's going to be diffusion. Okay. They diffuse back, and the energy of that diffusion is then used by flagellum to move. So, again, energy of ATP is used to create the gradient of hydrogens, and then hydrogens diffuse back to propel flagellum. Does that make sense? Now, if, any, remember, if anyone remembers the cellular respiration, this part where hydrogen is diffused, this is exactly what's used for ATP synthesis in cellular respiration. So there is some commonality between ATP synthesis and flagellar movement. The only kind of, the big difference is that here, hydrogen ion concentration is created by breakdown of ATP, and in cellular respiration, it is created by the movement of electron to electron transport change. We're going to talk about Any question? Awesome. So we're going to talk about some, some bacteria. And that's going to be That will be staphylococcus aureus. Okay. Staphylococcus aureus. Uh, we're going to mention three members. The genus, we're going to sort of go from least interesting to most interesting. So, staphylococcus epidermidis is a microorganism commonly found on your skin. Okay, good. It's a member of normal human skin microbiome. So, skin normal. In people who are extremely immunocompromised, it can cause wound infections, and the that is, but generally it's, it's, it's benign. 
you carrying it on your skin like that. Staphylococcus saprophyticus. Okay. This is the causative agent for the urinary tract infection. And the most notorious of them all, Staphylococcus aureus. Okay, so let's break down some of the infections that Staph aureus can cause. Skin and subcutaneous tissue. All right, sub Q, subcutaneous under this skin. So what are those infections? The most common one is lymphatigo. It's a skin infection that produces some blisters on the skin, not really painful, not even itchy, just looks kind of not well. Fairly easily treatable, very easy to transmit by contact. Okay, cellulitis. This is the um, deeper inflammation, that's subcutaneous infection. Super, like, not very deep tissues, but uh, subcutaneous tissues, okay? Infection of dermis and, and adipose tissue. Warm, tender areas of the skin, redness, again, antibiotics. I'm going to put Scalded skin syndrome, triple S. Uh, that's a pretty pretty cool story. I'm gonna draw it very quickly. So remember, there's a, a epidermal layer, right? And then there's a basement membrane, and that's dermis. That's epidermis. So one of the uh, virulence factors of staphylococcus, exfoliating toxin, it breaks down the basement membrane. Can you see the basement membrane here? So epidermis starts to fall off, like a, a person has been exposed to scalding and water. Very common in newborn, but very common. About a few thousand cases a year in the United States. Right? Um, looks terrible, treatable with antibiotics. Rancos carbancos. Um, infection of staphylococcal infection of the hair fold. Okay, foruncle, foruncle, and when several foruncles fuse together, that's a carbuncle. Um, it's like a purulent head. You can squeeze the pus out of it. it it's, it's pretty, pretty inconvenient. Now, staphylococcus can get into the deeper the connective tissue and it can produce a variety of virulence factors from uh, hyaluronidases that break down extracellular matrix to collagenases that break down collagen and if that happens in the connective tissue that leads to necrotizing fasciitis now I want to be very specific about necrotizing fasciitis. This is the disease. It can be caused by staphylococcus, but it can be caused by pseudomonas, it can be caused by streptococcus. So it's not like a, a bacteria, it's a disease. Does that make sense? You got it? So that is necrotizing fasciitis is usually in immunocompromised patients. Got it? Red, red, terrible red. Okay, um, respiratory, uh, pharyngitis. Basically sore throat, sometimes pneumonia. Okay. Cardiovascular system can cause endothoriasis. Inflammation of the cardiac valve. We're good so far? Um, I'm gonna throw from Staphylococcus aureus to the UTI. 
because already you have it here, it can cause urinary tract infections. So here, right here. Good. Following. Let's um, move the vascular urinary. It can migrate upwards and lead all the way to like pyelonephritis, kidney infections, but those are more rare. And of course, if we talk about the systemic effects, this will be toxic shock syndrome, TSS. Basically, it's a sepsis. So, Staphylococcus, Staphylococcus sores, it produces the toxic shock syndrome toxin, TSST, which overactivates your immune system. Does that make sense? As the result of that abnormal activation of your immune system, a whole bunch of inflammatory markers, they, they get into the blood, they lead to clotting, vasodilation, blood, uh, blood pressure draw, basically a shock. This is what we call toxic shock syndrome, okay? And people that was discovered, I think in the 70s, when uh, women were using uh, staphylococcus contaminated uh, hygienic products, tampons, and microorganism got in the circulation, and quite a few women died, actually. Does that make sense? Okay, so we've got staphylococcus. We're basically done with bacteria. Not forever. I can give myself a little bit more space here. And we're going to start talking about eukaryotic organisms and a little bit about viruses. Okay, so let's look at the eukaryotic cell. And we're going to do some, I'm going to do some drawing with like highlighting the function. So that's nucleus. We have the storage of genetic information, right? Everybody remembers that? It is surrounded not by one, but two membranes. So it's a double membrane organelle. Inside of the nucleus is the structure called nucleolus, small nucleus. Nucleolus is responsible for ribosome synthesis. We good so far? Nucleolus is not surrounded by membranes. It is not. Nucleolus produces ribosomal RNA and is essential for ribosome synthesis and assembly. Transport in and out of nucleus is regulated by nuclear pores. There are openings that allow stuff to get in and out, except for DNA. DNA cannot leave nucleus, and I want to specifically highlight it, it's going to be a theme. DNA is supposed to be here, not in the cytoplasm. Are we good? Clear? To get some stuff out of the equation, cell membrane. Structure is similar to bacterial, phospholipid bilayer, transmembrane proteins, transport, same idea, in and out, you know, channels, if it's a diffusion, pumps, if it's an active transport. So we kind of, I, I don't want to talk about cell membrane like the 15th time in your life. Okay. Next to the nucleus, we've got endomembrane system. It's basically a labyrinth of membranes. If, so close to the nucleus, is rough endoplasmic reticulum. It houses ribosomes responsible for protein synthesis. Okay? Smooth endoplasmic reticulum is responsible for the synthesis of lipids and carbohydrates. Okay. 
Okay, we're good? Now, kind of close to the most so part of endomembrane system is Golgi complex. Okay? So, lipids and proteins are transported to Golgi, which is responsible for modification of lipids and protein. Does that make sense? Now, a few more things. Vesicles, of course, transport things around, little bubble-like structures. Okay? Lysosome, break down of things. You can break down food, you can break down dysfunctional organelles, you can break down um, cellular parts, you name it. Another vesicle, that is peroxisome, okay? Um, synthesis of, and synthesis and breakdown of hydrogen peroxide. Um, modification of carbohydrates and lipids. Carbohydrates and lipid metabolism, you can write here. Either is fine. Okay, we're good? All right. Um, cytoskeleton. This is so pretty, but I will have to kill it. So next thing is to mention cytoskeleton. It used to be, in, in biology textbooks, it used to be said that, you know, uh, bacteria do not have cytoskeleton, and, and eukaryotic cells do. Not true anymore, bacteria do have a little bit of it, kind of a primitive cytoskeleton. But we, we don't mention it because it is primitive. So, cytoskeleton, three types of filaments. Microtubules, which are formed from the protein tubulin. They are dynamic. I'll explain what it is in a second. And they are crucial for the movement and cell division. And cellular, we'll put cellular transport. So, what does that mean, dynamic? They can be destroyed and formed again. Do you understand? Like in your house, kitchen is dynamic. Kitchen cabinets are dynamic. You can replace them. Right? Same goes for microtubule. You can destroy old ones, build new ones. Okay? Microfilaments. So that's going to be protein actin. They are dynamic. Mostly cell movement. And lastly, intermediate. Filament, uh, 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 protein keratin, they are static and necessary to maintain cell structure. I usually compare intermediate filaments with the studs and the beams of the house. If you destroy those, the house is going to collapse. Does that make sense? If you destroy keratin intermediate filaments, the cell is going to collapse. This is why we call them static. They're not supposed to be destroyed and reformed during the life cycle of the cell. Does that make sense? Good.
Any questions so far? Okay, um, we're going to briefly touch on the external appendages. If you don't mind, I'm not going to draw them. So we're talking um, cilia and flagellum. Okay, so flagellum is long, cilia are short. The motion of flagellum, remember in bacteria, it's a propeller. In eukaryotes, it's waving, like, like you're doing oar or a tail of the fish. They have different mechanisms of movement. Although the function is the same, it's movement. So cilia is also uh, moving parts. In, in protozoa, for instance, cilia can propel them forward by just, you know, beating synchronous like a, a bunch of little oars and just moving it like a boat. Okay, you got it? Good. Or, again in protozoa, cilia can synchronously move the environment towards some kind of a mouth part. You know what I'm talking about? Like... Like, if this is the mouth part and that's cilia, they will kind of move the environment towards the mouth part. Good? Clear? Okay. A couple of structures that can be found in some eukaryotic cells. And these structures are pretty interesting. So it's... A mitochondrion right here. It is a powerhouse of the cell. And chloroplasts. Okay, that's extremely schematic idea. Okay. So mitochondria. The function is Cellular respiration, first and foremost, okay? First and foremost, mitochondria respire. Chloroplast, its function is the reaction opposite to cellular respiration, which is photosynthesis. Now look at these two organelles. They both are double membrane. You see these two membranes of the chloroplast? You see two membranes of the mitochondria? Double membrane. Okay? Now inside of the chloroplast, you're going to actually find some folds, membrane folds here. That's folds. They're called grana. These folds are called, actually each fold is called a thylakoid. And the stacks of thylakoid, this stack is called a granum. That's where light dependent reactions of photosynthesis occur. We'll, we'll get to photosynthesis eventually. What I want to highlight a few things that mitochondria and chloroplasts have in common. The double membrane. Good. Both of them have DNA that looks like bacteria. Both of them have ribosomes that look like bacteria. And both of them are somewhat independent. Do you see some commonality here? Sort of some sort of a pattern. The DNA ribosomes, and if you will take mitochondria or chloroplast and put them in the um, egg, for instance, they will be able to reproduce by themselves. You good? So uh, all these all these features they suggest that these organelles a result of so-called endosymbiosis. So mitochondria most likely used to be aerobic bacteria 
that was acquired billions of years ago by its eukaryotic sort of pulse. Make sense, right? So there was a big eukaryotic cell that kind of incorporated aerobic bacteria. Bacteria got protection from predators and a steady flow of nutrients and eukaryotic host got itself a steady flow of ATP. Chloroplasts, I, thought, I mean, we can't say that it's confirmed because we never saw it, but all circumstantial evidence suggests that it's true. It used to be most likely photosynthetic bacteria. Okay? Question. Okay, we have some fun and we're going to talk about some, some bugs. Okay, I'm just trying to pull it away. The first um, group of microorganisms that we're going to talk about, eukaryotic, just kind of describe what they are, a protozoa. Remember, unicellular eukaryotes that do not have a cell wall. Am I clear? That's, that's the rule. They do not have a cell wall. We're going to classify them in four groups based on the locomotion. First is Sarcodina. Amoeboid motion. Am I clear? They move like amoebae, they form pseudopodia and they pull themselves somewhere else. Then we're gonna determine Mastigophora. That move with a flagellum. Ciliophora, as you can guess, move from with the cilia. Am I clear? And happy complex. Non moving. I want to focus your attention on one very important feature of AP complexa. They are obligate parasites. Can anyone hypothesize one? So you can find free living microorganisms in any of these three groups. You're not going to find any free living AP complexa. They will be Always parasites of humans, of birds, of animals, whatever. Any idea? What distinguishes them from the rest of the band? Bingo. They're not moving, so they can't get the food. They cannot swim towards the food or move towards the food. Does that make sense? And that's the problem. Well, not the problem, but all AP complex are parasites. Are we clear? So the microorganism that we're going to talk about is called Nigleria followed by it's a brain-eating amoeba. Okay. So I'm going to kind of highlight some features. First of all, you get it from environment. It's a free-living microorganism. It's not it's not an ultimate parasite. This amoeba lives in the water and the soil. And when you swim in, in the water, 
of mostly like thorns and lilies. You can may accidentally snort the water into your nose. Does that make sense? And if we would picture, and it's going to be a terrible picture, that's brain, okay? That's the nasal cavity. This is, well, I don't know exactly. So all in all, that's nose, that's brain. To get water in, there is a cribriform plate of a smoid bed. When you snort, there are little holes that allow um, filaments of olfactory nerve to get to the brain. And this amoeba can get through those tiny little holes all the way to the brain. Does that make sense? And at this point, it is trapped, it has nowhere to escape, and it starts to destroy the brain, it's the food for it. This leads to the condition that is called primary amoebic meningoencephalitis. Basically, it's a massive inflammation of meninges, and the brain. Does that make sense? A few interesting features of this disease. I, I find it absolutely fascinating. Majority of the infections of nervous system are not transmissible. So this PAM, primary amoebic meningoencephalitis, cannot be transmitted from the infected person. That's it. Does that make sense? Prognosis is terrible. Majority of patients die very quickly because it is hard to diagnose. By the time physicians make a diagnosis, it's usually too late. It is treatable, again, if it's diagnosed early. We good? Understood? Um, it's more common during the warm months, like summer, and it's more common in the southern United States. I have um, in, in the lecture notes, I have epidemiological data, it's pretty interesting. Look at them. I think I asked some questions in the study now. Okay, but it's like it's warm in warm weather, warm states. There are very few cases of you, like really very few, but they pretty tragic. So far, we good? Okay, next group of eukaryotes fungi so we can identify three main groups it's not a proper taxonomical classification mind you we Put them in different groups based on the modality, how they grow. First will be molds. Molds are multicellular. Okay? Multicellular fungi. Um, you all have seen molds, I guess. This fuzzy, um, you know, the juice and stuff like that. You with me? Okay. This fuzzy appearance is called mycelium, and mycelium is formed by high heat. Okay, so now. A E? Yes. Yeah, it sounds about right. High heat. Hyphae for mycelium. Uh, hyphae can be uh, uh, septate or non-septate, meaning that cells can be actually separated from each other or they can fuse with each other. The point is, it's multicellular organism. Does that make sense? There are still debates, bless you, whether we can call them um, truly multi-tissue because we don't really know if cells are differentiated or not. Okay? 
yeasts. Unicellular compounds. Like, indeed, albicans, or baker's yeast. Um, we're going to talk about like, modalities of growth and blah, blah, blah. So, but yeast are unicellular. All fungi can reproduce using spores, by the way. Then we have a third group, which is dimorphic fungi. So dimorphic fungi are moles in the environment. And yeasts in the environment. Okay, we're good. Understood. What we think is a trigger is a temperature. So it's kind of chill outside. So it grows molds. When they get in the warm human body, they become yeasts. So far, so good. Really. The fungus that we're going to talk about. Is histoplasma capsulatum. It's a dimorphic fungus. Uh, the rate, the, the route of infection is respiratory. It's pretty common to the forested areas of the states like Kentucky, Ohio, Tennessee. It's, it's, it's called uh, Ohio Valley fever sometimes. Um, people inhale spores. Then spores start to grow as yeasts in the lungs. So symptoms basically, it's basically pneumonia. But to develop the pneumonia, you have to be an immunocompromised patient. Okay? Majority of folks don't even know they have infection and it's usually self-resolving, so the body will just take care of it. If it is developing into the pneumonia, from pneumonia it can progress to a systemic infection. And systemic histoplasmosis is, without treatment, is uniformly lethal. It gets in the blood and the different organs, you do it. We good? Clear? Uh, it is a zoonotic infection, so maybe a new term. Meaning that it can be found in animals. Okay? It can be found in the droppings of birds and bats. Okay, we're good so far? Any questions? Okay, awesome. The last bit of eukaryotes. My favorite eukaryotes, Helmut. Oh. All parasitic helmets of humans can be divided into three groups. Hematodes, which are round worms, okay? They have body cavity and they have sexes, they have two sexes. They have males and females. So far, so good? Gametodes, which are unsegmented flatworms. Gametodes, also known as flukes. Okay. They have no body cavity. They are hermaphrodites. And then there are cestodes, 
that are segmented platforms, nobody cadre also a remote Okay? In general, all helmets go through three stages of development. It's going to be egg, larva, adult worm, which will produce eggs again. Any questions, any concerns so far? Good? Okay, spill. Let's talk about one really exciting cestode, which is Tinea soli, the fourth table. Let's take a look at the life cycle, okay? And the word cycle is important. It's a cycle. So what we're gonna start with is an egg, which is ingested by pigs. In the pigs, in the pig's intestine, egg, develops into larva, okay? Not, not, not pigs. Pigs do not develop into larva. That's egg develops into larva. Does that make sense? Larva goes from intestine to the tissues, specifically muscle tissue. And as you know, when we eat pork, we eat muscle tissue. Do I make sense? So far, are you following me? We eat muscle tissue. So, larva from the muscle tissue, from the undercoop pork, gets to humans, okay, and develops in the adult warm in the intestine, which can be several feet long, and you probably wouldn't know about it. Are we good so far? Make sense? Adult warm in the intestine will produce eggs. So you see this is a cycle. That's a normal cycle. And this is how it's supposed to be. Basically, adult worms produce eggs. We shed eggs in feces. Then the species, usually, we're talking about like really contaminated environment, end up in around pigs. They consume eggs, and, and that whole thing goes back again. In humans, this Infestation is usually asymptomatic. Maybe it's a little of a bloating, abdominal discomfort. Does that make sense? So, first of all, how adult worm is holding up in the intestine? It has suckers on its head, that is called skull, skulls, and it attaches by its suckers to the wall of the intestine. It just hangs off of it. It does not have a mouth part because it absorbs nutrients by diffusion. It's so flat, it absorbs nutrients by diffusion. It's very primitive. It is a segmented flat worm, so it's a cestode. And each segment of a worm that is called proglotid carries thousands and thousands of eggs. So humans can shed either eggs by themselves or they can shed proglottids, so called gravid proglottids that have with eggs. Humans can shed up 
to 100,000 eggs a day. These are the data we get. Does that make sense so far? Now, here's when the situation goes south. I'm going to draw slightly not normal life cycle, not normal. So imagine that we have eggs in the environment, right? But instead of being consumed by pigs, they contaminate human food, and they being consumed by a human. Eggs should develop into what? Larva. And where a larva, and it, that happens in the intestine, what larva is supposed to go? Issues. But this time, it's a human tissue. Does that make sense? If it's uh, muscles, a person develops myositis, okay, inflammation of the muscles. Because larva gets into the tissues, and guess what it does there? It dies there. And your immune system recognizes larva as being foreign antigen and tries to destroy it, and that leads to the massive inflammation around the larva. That makes sense. And if it gets in the brain, it leads to neurocystisorthosis. Okay, neurocystisorthosis. Same kind of inflammation, but in the brain. It's uh, one of the leading causes of epilepsy in the world. Infectious causes of epilepsy. You good so far? No questions. Okay. Um, so what I wanted to, I'm trying to think, I wanted to highlight something. Um, it's treatable. The infestation is treatable. There are antihelmintic drugs, and you can pass the word out. Second, I wanted to highlight. So, now think about it. If you are eating undercooked pork, which part of the life cycle, which form of the helmet are you eating? If you're eating undercooked pork. What are you eating? Look at the side. You're eating pork. Specific. Right there. It's a larva. Yes, thank you very much. It's a larva. I don't know who said that. Okay, thank you. Because I don't, <laughs> behind mosques, I kind of know a general area where the sausage is coming from. It's a larva, absolutely right. Is it too bad? Not really. I mean, that's unpleasant to some extent, but it's not super dangerous. This is when... It, now, what's the problem? If you have an adult worm, you start shedding eggs. Okay? Which means you or your neighbors can develop neurocystisarcosis by consuming eggs. Do I make sense? That's the problem. Clear? So, what they do? Cook your pork. That's actually, there. if you like it a bit raw, there is a way. Freeze it. Freezing kills lot. In pork. You good? So, yeah, that you can do. But in general, meat in the United States, Pork in the United States, pretty well checked, it's pretty clean. Okay. I strongly encourage you to listen to the corresponding lecture because I tell a really cool story there. I don't think we just have enough time for it here, but it's a really neat story about some other platform. And Tinian Soul. But conceptually, you know, we got it. Now, uh, last for the group of microorganisms that we're going to talk about to kind of wrap up that particular portion and we're going to talk about when the exam is going to be. It's going to be viruses. These are my favorite ones, of course. Okay? Things to remember. 
Hasten olur. Obligate intracellular parasite. I'm going to break it down. What does that mean? Mass. Obligate. Intracellular. Be in a cell. Parasite. Reproduce. They can only reproduce in the cell. Are we clear? Good. There are two good groups of viruses. Envelope and naked. Okay. To clear my conscience. To clear my conscience. There are viruses that basically consist of a genome only. We do not talk about them. Those are like exotic viruses of plants and insects. Okay. So enveloped viruses. Here's the structure. The genome genome, the capsid envelope. Naked viruses, genome, that's it. See the difference? Everybody appreciates the structural differences on this, right? So naked, only genome surrounded by protein capsid. So capsid is always protein. Okay. In both of them. Now, envelope viruses have genome and capsid, an envelope that consists of proteins and phospholipids. Do you remember which cell part consists of phospholipids? Anyone? Huh? Which cell part consists of phospholipids? The M1. So part that is made out of phospholipid. No, don't hesitate. The membrane, bingo, yes. So viruses, when they get out of the cell, they essentially steal a part of the membrane. Make sense? Um, again, coronavirus, <coughs> envelope. Interestingly enough, Enveloped viruses because they have this pretty fragile structure on the outside, the endome. Generally speaking, they are less resistant to environmental impact. Have you seen, maybe you heard some horrifying stories about virus lingering on the surface for days? Well, if I will uh, think of it this way. If I will take a water and splash it on the floor, by the time the class is over, water is gone, right? If I will flood this room using that shower, then to completely dry, it'll take a while, right? So in all those studies, what happens? Surface is being loaded with a massive amount of virus. Well, of course it's gonna lie. There was a study out of Germany where they sampled in like in the midst of pandemic, they sampled surfaces like in supermarkets, found nothing. Just could not, like commonly touched surfaces, could not find anything whatsoever in the like normal environment, not artificial, normal environment. So these are really fragile. What I do with my masks, like, when I, when I walk to my car, I throw it on the dashboard. By the time I get home, it's exposed to the sun. It's pretty much disinfected, okay? Does that make sense? Oh, yeah, I forgot to mention something. Why they are obligate intracellular parasites. No ribosomes. No ATP synthesis. 
So they depend on the cell. Okay? We're good? So we're going to talk about papillomavirus and then we're going to take the wave. Oh, yeah. Before we get to papillomavirus, let's add some more to viruses in general. What kind of genome they have? Remember, viruses are not living things. And all living things have double-stranded DNA, all of them, from bacteria to humans. Since viruses are not living, they can have DNA genome or RNA genome. They can have double-stranded or single-stranded DNA genome. And they can have double-stranded or single-stranded RNA genome. Am I making sense here? So you can see one strand of RNA, one strand of DNA, two complementary strands of DNA, or two complementary strands of RNA. We good? Okay, Stella. The Loma virus. Naked, okay? Double-stranded DNA genome. It's insanely resilient. It's one of the most environmentally resistant viruses that we know. There was a lovely paper several, three or four years ago, they looked at it, it's like a very concentrated bleach could, could inactivate it, this one. Hydrogen peroxide didn't work, ethanol didn't work. Yeah. So, how does infection happen? So this, uh, this is your skin, okay? Those are keratinocytes at the bottom. Can you see them? Those are the only replicating cells in the skin. Okay? So the virus infects keratinocytes, but skin has to be damaged. So it has to be spread something. It cannot like move cells away, push down. We clear? It infects keratinocytes. Now it's a DNA virus, right? And in the cells, um, and it needs to synthesize its own DNA. It needs to replicate its DNA in order to reproduce. Do I make sense? The virus has to make a copy of its DNA to make new virus. Now, when does a human cell makes a copy of its DNA? before which event, which cellular event. Why cells need to make a copy of a DNA before they do what? So you have one copy of a DNA and then you have two copies. For what? What you gonna do? You're a cell, what you gonna do? What do human cells do? Well, don't kiss it, they bingo. Divide, right? So cells, they copy DNA before they divide. We good? Majority of cells in human body, they don't. They just quiet, they quiescent state. So the virus forces these cells to reproduce in order to replicate the viral DNA as well. Does that make sense? The analogy would be like, you sitting at home, you're not hungry. You're not hungry at all. Your friend comes over, your friend's hungry. And your friend not only forces you to start making food, but your friend forces you to eat with him. Make sense? So what happens when the cells divide? They start to grow, and you have a wart. The wart can be on the skin, can be on the genitals, so it doesn't really matter. Are we clear? Now, when cells divide, they accumulate mutations. You with me so far? When they accumulate mutations, they can become malignant. Does that make sense? They can become cancerous. But in the human cells, there are mechanisms 
that will kill cells before they become malignant. You see what I'm saying? Like cell divides, they divide, 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 they accumulate mutations. If it looks bad, there are molecular mechanisms for P53 protein that will lead cell to apoptosis and we find no cancer. Got it? The problem with papillomavirus is that two strains, papillomavirus uh, type 16 and type 18, for some reason, they have their own mechanisms that turn off that safety switch. You see what I'm saying? So cell will not die when it becomes malignant and it will keep reproducing. Vi papillomaviruses, they do not need a tumor to reproduce. They fine, they don't need cancer. Cancer is an unfortunate bystander effect. See what I'm saying? Uh, it's a, a papillomavirus is a leading cause of cervical cancer in females, anal cancer in both males and females, and they contribute to penile cancer in males, and they thought to contribute to the throat cancer in both males and females. What do you do? You vaccinate. You have a vaccine, it's a marvelous vaccine, it's called Gardasil. It used to be approved for um, unexposed, um, uh, you know, pre-puberty teens. Because basically the idea was, this. this is the most common sexually transmitted disease in the world. So the idea is that if a kid didn't have sex, they cannot have a genital papilloma. Skin isn't an issue. Genitals is the problem, right? So we would give that kid a vaccine, and that would prevent the infection. True, it works. It works marvelous. Only problem with Gardasil, it's a bit expensive. Okay? But then, and, and the idea was, why do we give it to adults? Since adults most likely are infected already because they have a social, so, a sexual life. But then the study came out showing that even in the adults, the vaccine reduces, not prevents, but reduces the risk of developing corresponding cancer. With me, so now as far as I know, Gardasil is approved using adults as well. Yeah, if you could look, it's a uh, along with hepatitis B vaccine, it's the safest vaccine that we have. The side effect is the redness of the place of injection, etc. And if you have kids who are kind of going to that age, vaccinate them. Both of my boys are vaccinated. I think it's one time vaccination. Three? Three with Barnison? Three for adults. Huh? Three for adults. Oh, okay. They probably got two different. Huh? Yeah. Okay. I know hepatitis B is three for sure because I fucked it up. I didn't have third time. But yeah. So. It's no brainer. And the epidemiological studies very convincingly show that the rate of cervical cancer in vaccinated individuals is extremely low. So that's the rate. Good? Question? If not, let's take a break, come back, do some lab work. So let's chat about microscopy. I'm going to outline some concepts that you must know. So it turns to know about microscopy. You need to know what magnification is. Magnification is making an object bigger. Okay. We're good so far? Making it bigger. Magnification of a microscope. And I leave it to you to know the parts. It's only a lecture. Very simple like, memorization. So, magnification of ocular lenses multiplied by the magnification of objective. Okay? So, if it's 10 and it's 10, it's 100. 
preach to them, and it's a hundred, it's a thousand. That makes sense. Resolution. Resolution is not the same as magnification. Okay? Resolution is the ability to distinguish small details, and it is determined by the wavelength or frequency of light, you know, whatever. The point is, resolution of a light microscopy is limited because the wavelength is limited. The shorter the wavelength, the higher the resolution. And the shortest visible wavelength lingers about 300 nanometers. So that's the resolution of a, a light microscope, okay? 0.3 micrometers or 300 nanometers is the size. Am I clear so far? Okay, the contrast. Remember, microorganisms, except viruses, bacteria, protozoa, or fungi, whatever, they are cells filled with water, and we usually observe them in the water. Are you following me? Therefore, you're trying to observe a sack of water. In the water, contrast is not great. Anything that will increase the optical density of an object compared to the background, that's what contrast is. How much darker your object converts to the background. You clear? So those are three parameters that you should know and you kind of, you know, should focus your attention on. Like, know what they are. Now, types of microscopy. There are seven types of light microscopy and two types of electron microscopy that I want you to know. No more, no less. You should be able to identify these types by the general description. It is not complicated. It just, you know, if you study the table, you're good. So, light microscopy. We're going to start with light microscopy. First is going to be bright field. Bright field microscopy, you observe dark objects on the bright background. Does that make sense? This is the type of microscopy that you're going to be doing in this class. Okay? It's like garden variety, your typical light microscopy. Then we have dark field. You observe objects, microorganisms, that are lightened up and the background is basically black. It is very convenient to observe small life specimens. It's also very convenient to observe organisms like spirochetes, which are very, very narrow and regular bright field approach may not work. Good so far? Then we have two fairly similar approaches. One is phase contrast. So it's a high quality life specimen. For instance, this device, this microscope, it has phase contrast ability. Allows you to observe even some internal structures you can see using phase contrast. Then you have differential interference contrast microscopy, DIC. I'm going to put this in the quotation marks 3D image. Okay? It's not really 3D image of live specimen. But it is as close to 3D as we can imagine. Am I clear? Does that make sense? It gives you some three-dimensional appreciation of what's going on. We good? Fluorescent microscopy. Uh, that requires a little bit of explanation. So imagine you have a, a whole bunch of microorganisms of different kinds. And then you use a special dye that will bind to only one 
type of microorganisms in the mixture. Does that make sense? So therefore, you can shine the black light, UV light, in your mix. And you will see only your specific microorganism, only the one that you actually obtain for the microbe. Does that make sense? Because this organism will start to flourish. And the focal microscopy. It's a light approach in the light microscopy that allows you to produce a three-dimensional image. Have you heard about the model? Like CT or MRI? So what these techniques do with the human body, they take images of the human body at different uh, plane. And then they combine those images to make a 3D vector structure. Does that make sense? The focal microscopy does exactly the same. It takes slices, images at different focal distances, different focal planes, takes multiple images of an object. And then based on those images, it reconstructs the 3D structure of a specimen. We're good? Really? Number seven is two photon microscopy. So this is the combination of fluorescent and confocal. It uses fluorescent dyes to specifically stain for particular cells. So imagine that you can stain one population red, one population green, and one population blue. So you can distinguish the three populations of cells. Am I clear? And on top of that, you can utilize the focal approach to see where these populations are at a given moment. And moreover, two photon microscopy allows you to get 3D images of specimens when they are alive. You don't need to fix them. You can look at the moving cells in somewhat 3D environment while they are fluorescent. Am I clear? As you can imagine, as we go this way, the price for the equipment progressively increases. Good? Okay. Any questions so far? Yeah, it's okay. Electron microscopy. Two types that I want you to know. Scanning. And special. Okay. Scanning microscopy. Surface. You have no idea what's inside, but you know pretty well how the cell looks like outside, you know, what is the shape and stuff. Good? Transmission allows you to see internal structure of the specimen. So we use electron microscopy to look at the really, really small objects like viruses, right? So if you want to identify the internal structure of the virus, for instance, you would use transmission microscopy. Does that make sense? If you want to look at the surface, the structure of a, of a, of a small algal cell, how it looks from the outside, that's going to be scanning. Good? Okay. Now, remember, so basically different types of microscopy allows you, allow you to increase the resolution of 
With electron microscopy, it's a better resolution than light microscopy. What about contrast? To improve contrast, these stains. Okay? Before we use a stain, we often fix a specimen. If you think about microorganisms, if you like put them on a slide and stick them under the microscope and you look down at them, they're going to be moving, which is not really convenient if you want to know certain details about the cell, right? Because it's much harder to appreciate it when the cells are moving around. So we fix cells in order to stop them from moving, in order to attach them to the microscopy slide so they're not going anywhere. Okay, so when we fix the cells, we usually fix them over the flame. You will learn how to do that. You kind of slide the, uh, you move the slide with the microorganisms, one, two, three, through the flames, and they being basically burned into the slide. Are you with me? And then we stain them to increase contrast, to make them stand out from the background as much as we can. And so stains can be simple and refreshing. Simple stains stain all microorganisms the same. Okay? Simple stains can be further divided into positive stains and negative stains. So what is the difference between positive and negative? Positive stain, it stains the cell. Now, does anyone remember what is the charge, electrical charge on the surface of the membrane of a bacterial cell? Surface are phosphate groups. And what is the charge of a phosphate group? Plus or minus? You don't remember, it's fine. It's negative. I told you that it's going to be important, and it's, that's where it's important. So membrane, the surface is negative. So positive stains that stain the cell, actually the, the molecules of the stain are charged positively. So positively charged molecules bind to the negatively charged surface of the cell. Does that make sense? This is why they stain the cell. Negative stains that are, well, negatively charged, they stain the background because they are repelled from a bacterial cell. Does that make sense to you? Very happy. Clear? Now, again, cell is not stained, but the background is stained. Now, I remind you that those stains stain all cells the same. Like they do not distinguish between different types. Now, a differential, here we go. You have a gram stain. Guess what it allows you to distinguish between? Bingo, gram positive, gram negative. So allows you to distinguish gram positive and gram negative bacteria. Then you have acid oxygen stain. It allows you to stain mycobacteria. Remember that, that unique um, group of bacteria that have mycolic acid on the outside? They are impervious to gram stain, so you have to use acid oxygen. We're clear. Now, next three, I always make this sort of announcement. For obvious reasons, next three stains, I will never ask a question. What is the function of one of those? Three parts. One of them is a capsule stain. What do you think it stains for? A capsule. Yes. Again. 
another one is the jeller stain. What do you think it stains for? The flagellum. So obviously the answer is in it would be in the flesh. And the last one, the endosperm stain. Obviously stains for endosperm. Good. Now, I want to quickly go over the procedure for the grass stain to, because that is the most important, okay? So, we're going to have gram positive and gram negative, okay? So those are gram positive and gram negative cells. You follow me? So the first step is addition of crystal violet, which is a simple stain, and it stains both gram positives and gram negatives blue. Well, purple. Okay? You with me so far? Then we had iodine. So crystal violet is called a primary stain. Okay. Iodine is called a mordant. So what it does, it makes the primary stain to stick to the cells better, but it doesn't add anything to the color. And it turns out that after the mordant, crystal violet in gram positive cells is, is stuck. And in gram negatives, not so much. Are you following? Then we add alcohol, which is depolarizing. So alcohol depolarizes gram negatives but cannot depolarize gram positives. Does that make sense so far? And then you add what's called a counter stain, it's called safranin. Okay. Now remember, gram positives are already purple, violet, violet is the color. Okay, so they're already violet, so safranin doesn't do anything. But remember, gram negatives are colorless at this point, so gram negatives become red. Primary stain, mordant, depolarizer, counter stain. Good. So, any question? You do need to know the steps. Basically, my goal here, I'm not covering everything, but study guide and these review sessions will give you a pretty good grasp on what you need to know. Let's, let's talk about bacillus, and then we will start probably chatting about cultivating that place. We're going to have very little stuff left for um, class. Okay. Bacillus, let's give it a general characteristic. Run positive. Aerobic and the spore forming. Environmental. They are found in the environment, probably. We good? Uh, what do you think is the shape of the silver? 
Anyone looked at the table with the shapes yet? Bacillus is a shape of bacteria. It means rod shape. They just got the name for the whole genus because they are rod shape. Okay? Let's take a look at some species. The boring one will be on the left. Uh, Bacillus subtilis. A research answer. Um, Nina, these magnificent, huge uh, blobs, that was Bacillus subtilis. It's all over the place, like everywhere. Okay, pretty normal. Non pathogenic, okay. Another non pathogenic, Bacillus, Bacillus thuringiensis. So, Bacillus thuringiensis is a pretty cool bacteria. Um, you may have heard about the insecticide called Bt. If you haven't, it's fine. But Bt is certified organic insecticide which is derived from that bacteria. For instance, in Florida, they use Bt to control mosquito population in seven keys. They, they spray uh, the area from the planes, and it's totally safe for humans, okay? And then we're gonna talk about a couple of pathogen types. So one is Bacillus cereus. And it gives you food poison. I want to distinguish very clearly between the gastrointestinal infection and food poison. Do you see the difference? This microbe does not infect your gut. It produces a toxin that makes your stomach sick. Now, how? One of the mechanisms is pretty clear. So it forms endospores, right? Imagine you have a bunch of rice, like rice grains. They dry, so it's not the best place for microorganisms to be. But it's okay for endospores. So endospores of Bacillus cereus are sitting in that rice. And then this rice goes into cooking in some restaurant, Asian restaurant, okay? They boil it, but they're not gonna boil the rice for every client. They boil it, and then they keep it in like a, a vat, a rice cooker, whatever, at a certain temperature, okay? Now think about it from the perspective of endospore. When it gets boiled, nothing happens, endospores are resistant. When it gets cooled down, endospore terminates, and it produces an actual bacteria. This actual bacteria, Bacillus cereus, produces a toxin, which is heat uh, it's stable, and it stays on that rice. Does that make sense? Eventually, when rice is heated up to like 50, 60 degrees Celsius, bacteria die, but toxin remains on top. And then people consume that rice and may get stomachs. This, this epidemiology, I didn't make it up. It was linked. Like, it's known that particularly rice is vulnerable to bacillus cereus food poison. We're good so far? And finally, the most fun of them all, bacillus anthracis. It's the causative agent of, well, anthrax. Okay? Its toxin inhibits protein synthesis and leads to the cell death. So what are the routes of acquisition? Um, so first of all, let's talk about the, 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 the reservoir. It's a zoonotic disease. So associated with animals, it's found in cattle or other ruminants, for instance, uh, uh, caribou deer, okay? You follow me so far? How you can get it from um, cabbage? Contact. It's going to be um, 
skin anthrax. And the name of that, of that uh, PESPA, or PESPA. So basically, you have a pretty terrible lesion on your skin, like a dark necrotic lesion. Does that make sense? It's not yet life-threatening, can be treated with antibiotics. Food, if you consume uh, the meat of infected cattle, you can get um, intestinal anthrax, and it is bad. You can fairly quickly die. Respiratory, you inhale either bacteria or endospores. Um, pneumonic anthrax, respiratory anthrax, is the most dangerous of them all. Does that make sense? So examples would be um, asthma attack. Oh, no. The attacks um, after 9-11, anthrax attack after 9-11, were precipitated by anthrax. Sent in the mail, radicalized, two people died. There are regular outbreaks of anthrax, uh, practically one within the world. Some countries, in some countries, it's more common, in some countries, it's less common. But the point is, here's the deal. If you have a, 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 a herd of cattle, and they get infected, you cannot do anything with that cattle except to slaughter them, right? And technically, it's not even slaughter. It's called a, to, to call them. Because slaughter implies that you eat them afterwards. You cannot do that. So you slaughter them, now you have a, a bunch of corpses that you need to get rid of. Ideally, you would burn them. But you cannot do it like in a bonfire, you need it like some kind of machine, and they're numb. You cannot burn a cow. Easy, okay? So instead, people dig a giant mass grave, put the cows there, corpses there, and it will cover them with some chemicals, cover them with the dirt, Put the sign by the hat. Here's the problem. The signs get missing, and on top of that, that chemical often is not enough to destroy endospores, especially if they are deep in the tissue. Does that make sense? So chemical gets washed away, but the endospores persist in the tissues. So eventually they will be go up with the capillary forces through the soil. I mean it may take tens and dozens of years. But they can eventually emerge on the surface of the on the surface on the grass, and cattle will eat it again. There is a chance, and this infection will happen again. So it's absolutely normal. Like we're not going to get rid of anthrax anytime soon. It's basically proper management management of grasslands and you know, pasture land. But it happens in the United States. It happens in Canada, in Russia, in Europe, everywhere. Okay, like small objects. Any questions? No? Good. It was explored as it, it was as close to bio, biological warfare as you can imagine. It was the closest. It's very easy to weaponize. Now we have um some time left, I'm gonna chat. I'm gonna start chatting about my cultural cultivation. Uh, so we're gonna cover some ground here. There are four or five steps of let's write them down. Just write them down. What are the steps of my cultural cultivation? It's inoculation, incubation, yeah, it's fine. Isolation. Inspection and identification. Okay. So, what is inoculation? You did it today. You did it. Yeah. You put it in the medium. You put it in the medium. Now, what is medium? Medium is any kind of substance or any kind of living organism can support the growth of a microbe. Does that make sense? So agar is the medium. Chicken stock can be a medium. Um, milk, can, bread can be a medium. 
You see? Like we are a media. Got it? But like surface of the table, for bacteria, it's not a medium. If you find something that can eat the surface of the table, sure, it's gonna be a medium. But generally speaking, like objects like this are not medium. Second, inoculation is a deliberate act. Am I clear? So if you accidentally slap your finger into the agar plate, you did not inoculate it, you ruined it. Okay? It's a deliberate act. You deliberately put microbes on the meat. Now let's talk about meat. Um, we can classify them using several sort of features. First, we can classify them based on their physical state. We got solid, liquid, and semi-solid. So, solid medium. Agar. First and foremost. Agar is liquefiable. If you heat it up, it's going to become liquid. Am I clear? You cool it down, it becomes solid again. Okay? What you use this medium for? I would call it mostly, use the word, analytical. So, remember your hand wash plates? You wouldn't be able to get a lot of bacteria from those hand wash plates, from those colonies. It's not a lot, right? But you can clearly identify different species, for instance. We're good? This is why I call it analytical. It's not prep medium. We cannot prep a huge amount of microbes. But it allows you to distinguish different types of microorganisms on the solid medium. Liquid medium. All kinds. I'm going to call them broth. But quite frankly, when your milk goes sour, milk serves as the medium. For bacterial microbial growth. Does that make sense? That would be prep. Not only, not only, look, you can have a liquid medium and you can add some indicator in it. You see what I'm saying? Like pH indicator. When bacteria grow, pH changes, the color of medium changes, it's analytical. But you can't and use only liquid medium to accumulate massive amounts of micro. Does that make sense? Can you distinguish different species in the liquid medium? No, you can't because they'll mix, right? Like it's 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 you cannot tell apart. That makes sense. Good. See my soul. It's a cloth like I mean it, it's not it's not liquid. It's not very solid like a gar. It looks more really like a really kind of soft, soft, very soft gel. And if you flip the tube with a semi-solid medium, it will eventually do that. It vanishes a lot. Um, I'm going to put it in parentheses a lot, okay? And it's analytical. So you can do some um, identification, you can do some indicators, like color changes, you know, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna do it in a slightly different form. But you can do some color changes and stuff like that, okay, follow me? But you cannot accumulate massive amounts of microbes in so much stuff. So far, so good, right? Um, you can address the motility of microbes because it's semi-solid. So in a gar, microbes inside of the gar, they cannot really spread. In liquid, they spread by default, right? Because of like diffusion and stuff. In semi-solid, microbes that can move will be moving through the medium farther than the ones that cannot. It's kind of penetrable enough for flagellar microorganisms to kind of crawl 
that makes sense. Now another classification of media, chemical composition. They can, media can be defined, chemically defined, media can be complex. So, um, chemical composition for defined media is no. And for complex, I will. Let's decipher. Um, here's my copy in that, in that moment. Do I know the exact chemical composition of my copy? Like all the molecules and all that shit that's in there. No, I do. No. I kind of know that it has caffeine, sure. That's about it, right? Well, we don't have anything here in this room right now, but if I will be to bring um, a solution of sodium chloride, a 5% solution of sodium chloride in water, do I know the chemical composition of that solution? Well, it's water and sodium chloride, right? That's it. So, that's defined media. In defined media, we know the exact, exactly what's in there, in which concentration to the point, to the, to the like tenth or hundredth of a gram or thousandth. Does that make sense? We know exactly what's there. Complex medium will be something like milk, broth, okay? This TSA agar that you use, TSA stands for triptychase soy agar. So it's a soy protein, basically soybeans, okay? Protein isolated from soybeans, all protein, all of them. And then it is exposed to trypsin. So what exactly is there? We don't know. Okay, we know that what's there is sufficient for microbes to grow. Am I clear? Now, if you will compare them, this is with the exact composition. This is like basically a, a buffet of nutrients. You might ask, well, I can't understand why complex. Because if you don't know what microbes need, you throw everything, hoping that they will grow. Does that make sense? Like, if you don't know what your party eats, you invite them to the buffet. People will find something. Why use define? Like, what's the point? The point is, you can control the composition of the meat. You can change the variable. You see what I'm saying? If you want to know whether or not your microbe needs amino acid glycine, you can grow it on a defined medium, then remove glycine and see if it still can grow. Does that make sense? You understand what I'm trying to say? Okay. Now the last classification of medium, we're going to wrap it up afterwards, is on the purpose. But the purpose. So purpose of medium, general purpose, self-explanatory, okay? Like that's for just growing my okay? TSA, triptychase soy agar, is a general purpose medium. Does that make sense? It's general purpose medium. Then you have enriched medium. Example, a uh, microorganism called Neisseria, Neisseria meningitis, is Neisseria gonorrhea, they grow only on enriched medium, which has a blood. Either whole blood, so-called blood agar, or cooked blood. Blood that was terminally treated, it's called chocolate agar. So, why do you think Neisseria need blood? Obviously, they don't need blood, they need something that's in the blood. It's chemical, some chemical element that's in the blood. They need iron. And it's the easiest way to deliver 
bioavailable iron. Does that make sense? Microbes that require some extra factor to grow are called plastids. Is that me? I call them picky microbes. Okay? So, for instance, if you will try to grow any cereal on TSA, it's not going to grow. If you add blood to TSA, the cereal will grow. Does that make sense? You got it? Um, I'm selective and differential. So, what's the di difference? Selective medium supports the growth of one micro, but not another. For example, Makontia um, bar contains bile salts, which prevent gram-positive microbes from growing. Does that make sense? It allows gram-negatives to grow, but not gram-positives. So it is selective medium. Does that make sense to you? Okay, now, differential medium does not necessarily inhibit anything, but it makes different microorganisms to look different. Am I clear? You understand what I'm saying? So, for instance, on that same... Uh, On the medium that is called EMB, eosin blue, if you grow microbes that can ferment lactose, the colonies will appear purple. If they cannot ferment lactose, they will appear colorless, not purple. Both of them can grow, lactose fermenters and non-fermenters, but they will look different, if that makes sense. And please understand, the same medium can be like both. So, for instance, EMB, the one that I mentioned, EMB medium, in the other, it is selective because it prevents the growth of gram positives, and it's differential because it allows you to distinguish um, lactose fermenters versus non fermenters. Does that make sense? Blood agar is enriched medium and differential medium because it allows you to distinguish between hemolytic and non-hemolytic bacteria. So the questions that you can expect about these folks, I give you a description of a medium. Okay? Um, EMB inhibits the growth of gram-positive bacteria and allows you to distinguish lactose from versus no lactose. What is it? It's the selective differential medium, right away. Does that make sense? And I tell you, it's an agar. So agar, okay, it's a soul, right? So based on the description, you just need to pick a proper terminology. Clear? It's usually pretty straightforward. Um, a few, like, Couple of words. Viruses. Anyone remembers what viruses require for reproduction? Can they reproduce? Just throw the virus in like liquid and reproduce. Can it do that? What does it mean? It's obligate parasite that has to obligatory reproduce in what? Inside the cell, yes. So we need cells. You can grow viruses in animals, but it's really expensive. So this is why we grow viruses in cells. We culture cells, okay? Like human cells or animal cells, whatever. And then we grow viruses in the cell. And cells themselves, that sounds really funny, but like when you grow cells, you they need their own liquid medium to grow. They need nutrients and stuff. Is that clear? Second, can you use live animals as the, as, as the medium? The answer is absolutely yes. 
uh, some elements, microfilarial elements, uh, or trichinella uh, spiralis, it's a muscle parasite. They cannot grow in the cell, and they cannot grow outside of the pores. So you have to grow them in mud just to cultivate them. Does that make sense? You can use plants as the medium, especially for, for plant viruses, okay, plant parasites. You can use eggs as the medium. Um, the flu vaccine, except for the, I think, one that is used for elderly, the newest one, uh, all other flu vaccines grown in eggs. Which is not super convenient because, you know, eggs can be they can be shortage, they have to be made, they have special eggs, they have to handle them properly, blah, 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 all the things. Okay? Make sense? Any question? No? Okay, so, um, have a wonderful Labor Day weekend.